Welcome to the Educational Physics Podcast. I am your host, João Figueiredo. This podcast is all about education, pedagogy, mindset, and uh, really any other nonsense that I think about during the week. Enjoy. Welcome to today's podcast. Today, I want to talk to you about play and the role of play in child development and how it can promote a healthier upbringing and overall relationship with the world, other humans, and ourselves. So first, let's talk about what is play and how that relates to children. We all know that children love to play. So why is that? Why are we so hardwired to explore games and um, inventions and imagination? Why is that so ingrained in us? Well, like most things go when they are hardwired into us, that means that there's some sort of relationship with evolution, biology. It's uh, innate to humans to uh, interact with other humans and ourselves and the world, including objects and whatnot, through play. So the reason for that is that it allows children to experiment in a safe environment. So I want to bring to you uh, this idea of simulation, right? So if we think about the simulation theory, where supposedly we are not really here, but in fact, this is just a simulation being ran by superior beings. Well, that might or might not be true, uh, but... We do simulate scenarios constantly. We do that through dreams, planning, um, brainstorming, and play. We do that even as adults if you are so inclined to play, uh, you know, video games. That's a simulation of reality. Sometimes way too fantastic to be believable, sometimes perfectly believable. If you're playing a sports game uh, on PlayStation... Well, that's pretty much believable. There's not a lot of need for suspension of disbelief because we know that football exists and basketball exists. And that's kind of how you play the game, although those are all characters behind my screen. Okay. So children use play for that reason. It allows them to test things out and simulate uh, things out and understand if that simulation, if it were ran for longer, for any longer, would that give them diminishing returns or increasing returns, which is the concept of game theory, or at least one of the elements of game theory. Um, the idea is that if the child wants to role play, for example, That's an instinctive reaction of the child to actually work out a way to interact with different people without the the social exposure and the pressure that could come from it. So they play different roles and they get you, the adult, the parents, to play different roles as well. So that way, that, that social world becomes multiple social worlds. And they can constantly run new simulations and see what what the rules are and how it changes and how it becomes more or less challenging depending on what the rules are. Why do children love to play, uh, you know, mummies and daddies? Well, they are working out family dynamics in a safe environment. Safe because they are actually not having children, and then learning how to do that. So they're learning about care and empathy and and relationships between mommy and daddy and mommy and daddy and the child, right? Usually you'd see three kids and they don't have to be of the the gender of the role they are playing, which is also very interesting. Um, Although probably problematic nowadays to even say that, but uh, I would say that What is interesting is that you can find three kids, um, three boys, let's say, and 
they just assign roles to each other. Like you're the mummy, you're the daddy, and you're the baby. And, and then they kind of behave according to those roles, but they also don't, which is interesting. If you observe them, the, the boy who's been told that he's the mummy is not really behaving like a woman. He's just behaving like a caretaker. And the boy who's, who's, given, who's been given the role of the baby is not behaving like a baby, although maybe even at first he or she will make a couple of goo dadas to make the role more believable. Uh, but eventually the goo dadas go away if these children are already of speaking age and, and they will engage with each other, with each other um, as peers who are trying to work out what this business of having a family is. Um, my kid loves to play um, exploration games, right? So he, 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 when we go to the park, he, he pretends that he's a dog and I need to find him. And then, you know, we are going on a mission. But you know how quickly it takes for him to go from I'm a dog to I'm a dog who's now been casted a spell on so I can talk. And actually, you know what? I'm a little hungry, so I'm going to cast another spell on myself so I can I can eat human food. So the whole play starts to deconstruct itself and it becomes, but it doesn't break down. And that's what's important. The play doesn't break down. It's not like he goes, I'm hungry, so the game's over. No, it's let's work out new rules here. But the play must continue. In fact, as we know, uh, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, you know that what's difficult is to get them to stop playing. And, and that's our adult and so, social needs coming into play as well. But uh, when we request them to stop role playing and just focus on finishing their lunch, for example, but that can also be turned into a game, by the way, which I do with my kid. Um, in fact, our meal times are a perfect example of what I've been talking about. So I was actually not going to talk about that, but I will because I think it's relevant. So during mealtime, my, my kid and I have this little game that we play. We call this the crazy ideas time. We look each other in the eyes, really deep in the eyes and uh, into each other's eyes. And, um, and we said, you know what time it is? It's crazy ideas time. So the rules of this game are as follows. Rule number one, we can only have a crazy idea once we've had three mouthfuls of food and we alternate. It's one crazy idea for him, one for me. Uh, so he needs to have three mouthfuls of food and then he's eligible to present his crazy idea. Now, these crazy ideas also have rules. They have to be in the future and they have to be something that we would like to have or achieve or become. So it's quite interesting where he mind, his mind goes. Like he's very into having things in the future around his house, there are basically uh, robots and uh, lots of automation. He barely wants to do anything. <laughs> and um, But what's interesting is that we've combined eating quickly with imagination. Three mouthfuls gives you one crazy idea. You can just tell me whatever madness you're thinking about, which again, has to be in the future. Uh, achievable, well, not realistic, they're meant to be crazy, but something that you would like to achieve and or have or become. And there are also rules for when that doesn't happen. So if the three mouthfuls, um, well, if if it takes him too long to have those three mouthful, mouthfuls, we know that, okay, one mouthful is added. So now you need at least four mouthfuls to present your crazy idea. And there's another rule, which is as soon as dad is done eating and my plate is empty, the game's over. Uh, so that motivates a lot of eating quickly, uh, which creates a habit, right? Eventually the play, the role playing, the crazy ideas, which by the way, I love to do. Um, and I have, to, I love to explore my own crazy ideas, but um, that's my need for play. But the reality is that this simulation, this need for creating fictional scenarios where we can role play, where we can develop our social skills is innate to us. 
And the point of coming up with these rules, like as children get a little older, my son is now five years old. So we are playing games, for example, actual games like Jenga or, or puzzles, whatever. And he comes up with new rules for the games, which is extremely interesting because then it allows them to see how rules are created, what for, and what limits the game to the point that the kind of the game doesn't really work anymore. And it starts to teach the child exactly what rules are for, uh, why they exist, and why they are important, and why it's important to find the sweet spot of between freedom and rules. Now, why is that important? Obviously, we can't live in complete freedom. And, and by complete freedom, I mean, you know, just... Um, Absence of rules altogether. I don't want to call it anarchy because that's quite different, but, but chaos. Let's call it chaos. We don't want to leave, live in chaos, right? But to, also we don't want to live in complete order, right? If everything is just rules, 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 then it kind of defeats the purpose of it in a way. So we need to find exactly where the, the sweet spot is between rules and freedom, chaos and order, yin-yang. And children practice that as well as they start to develop their own rules. When they play with each other amongst other children, right? Uh, they come up with games and rules and let's play this. And it's kind of hide and seek, but it's not. My kid comes up with all sorts of combinations of games. Like it's hide and seek, but uh, we'll bring the football because then when I'm hiding, I'll kick the football. So it gives you a clue. So he mixes all things together and he might make the game a bit impractical. And he will eventually realize that the point of hide and seek is that people don't know where you are. So kicking the ball is a big giveaway. <laughs> but that's besides the point for him now. What he's doing is working out different ways to combine and, 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 and explore new games or combine games that he knows, football and hide and seek all put together. And then new rules, which will give him an understanding of how boundaries really work. Then, of course, we need to ask ourselves, how do we help children manage play, right? So if we if we now look at this from the perspective of parents slash educator, we know that rule, uh, excuse me, we know that play has a, a role in child development. Jean Piaget was a pioneer in developing these ideas. And he believed that we had these four stages of development um, going from uh, more motor and sens sensory based um, development, and then more observational, then more concrete, where we actually reach conclusions. One of the things that one of the stages that is really, really important, for example, is the develop development of memory uh, and object related memory. So uh, I believe it's known as object permanence uh, awareness. So what, what happens, as we all know, like when, when we're dealing with babies, like six months, months old babies, um, if, if, if I hide behind the sofa, that baby um, will really believe that I've just vanished. There is no understanding that, in, that invisibility is not absence. It's just because I'm outside of his field of vision. Which is why some babies uh, and children struggle, but mostly babies. Hopefully, children wouldn't struggle with that so much if they are properly properly developed. Um, I would say that 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 fear that fear of abandonment, right? That that abandonment anxiety that should go away. But babies struggle with that precisely because they don't understand that mummy just went next, uh, just went into the kitchen, and whilst the baby is in the bedroom, for the baby the mummy disappeared. She's gone. Poof. So now I'm in danger. I don't have my family around me, and that creates that abandonment anxiety. So. How can we help them manage this? Well, through play. Play is actually quite powerful in this regard because we can then play games, as most parents do, of uh, hiding and showing up. Hiding and showing up. What is that creating? We, we are prompting the next stage of development, the object permanence awareness. Uh, and that means that the child will 
you know, through repetition, realize, okay, so mommy disappears and then shows up again. So she's not gone. Or if she's gone, it's not for too long. And then you can even, hey, you can reveal the trick. You bring the baby. So if you're hiding behind the sofa and the baby's in front of the sofa, you hide, you show up, you hide, you show up, and then you show the trick. You grab the baby and you both hide and show up and you can have maybe daddy being the surprised one right um but then the baby's in on the game and now he or she will understand oh hold on i'm not disappearing when i'm hiding i can still see me and i can still see mommy and we're both hiding and daddy gets surprised and they work out the rules of that game and that's a prompt a, a, a little bit of support a stepping stone that will take that child over to that next stage of development. And that's the power of play, right? So we, 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 as children get older, we can continue to play that role. So we can create play. We can then allow the child to explore. And as they get older, that exploration will be more solo. But then you as the educator, as the parent and educator can still play a role in how they integrate that play into their um, development. For example, uh, the child goes out exploring and then thinks about what conclusions he could take from that exploration. Questions that the child might have and, and you as the parent can then engage in that process of discussing uh, conclusions and questions and maybe even uh, grab a book or Google some new information on, on, on that topic. And then basically with those questions, with those answers even, go out and play again and re-explore the same scenario with now more information uh, in stock. And that's the cycle of play and, and, and development, right? You play, you explore, you ask questions, you reach conclusions, you play, you explore, you ask questions, you reach conclusions, and so on and so forth. So there's several studies um, that I think are very relevant and very interesting when it comes to child development and play. I've mentioned already Jean Piaget. Uh, Igor Vygotsky was another one who also explored this in a very interesting way. And I've already spoken about uh, Vygotsky in a, a past podcast. Um, there's also an interesting book called Play and Development by Artin Gonku. Uh, I hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, and it's quite interesting as it explores um, the potential contribution of parents, uh, the potential contribution of children in their own development and how that um, relationship should be or must be symbiotic. Um, the, the framing against the ecosystem of a child and its development um, or their development and and the, the framing, the philosophical framing, the metaphysical framing. So there, there's so there's many levels to this when it comes to understanding play. But for me, more importantly, is our awareness, that of the parents and educators, uh, when it comes to exactly what our role is. And how do we find that sweet spot between allowing the child to play and of course then establishing boundaries and also instilling some level of discipline and impulse control, which is important. Just because we want to play doesn't mean that we can play all the time, or perhaps we can turn that into play as well. But obviously, as the child gets older, it is also important to allow the, the the child, the children to understand exactly what kind of play is acceptable and when. For example, if the children are in a classroom learning, learning through play is fundamental. But is all play allowed? No. So that actually is part of now the game of the classroom. In the classroom, the rules are etc. etc. And that is how children will really 
conceptualize rules and freedom and exploration and that trifecta there in the most beneficial uh, way possible. They will understand the importance of rules because they will understand the importance of games. And in games, I apologize if this is also controversial, but in games, the goal is to win. Now, that doesn't mean that there has to be someone else who's a loser, although competition is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and even in, in the style of teaching that I promote, which is growth mindset uh, oriented, competition is important. And there is a time and a place for that. And there is a time and a place to be a winner. And there is a time and a place to be a loser. And there are lessons behind both of those outcomes. But the importance of rules within the context of a game is that it allows you a clear path or gives you a clear path to win. Well, rule number one is don't break the rules. If you want to win, that's rule number one, isn't it? So I would say that this is something that I would like to discuss more and more and more in my podcasts, and I will study this more deeply. This is very interesting to me, the gamification of education, which sometimes for educators, it can be a little strange because maybe we've disconnected a bit from our own inner child. But gamification works and it's not turning into education into something silly. Competition works. It's not turning education into something um, sports-like. Simulation works. Role play works. I speak to my, to my students all the time and I say to them, imagine that you are so-and-so as you perform this exercise. When I'm teaching them how to play something, very often we, we work on simulation, emulation, imitation. What is that if not play? In fact, I teach music. What do we, we don't say we music, we say we play music. Well, for me, that word is not there by accident. It's play, it's games, it's role play. It's invention and exploration and improvisation. You can't become a good improviser if you're scared of playing games. But you can't become a good improviser if you're resistant, resistant to rules. And a good improviser is not just someone who can play music uh, without the need to, to memorize it or prep it or whatever. A good improviser is someone who is creative. And that applies to anything in life. It's not just for music. A creative engineer is someone who understands the rules, but within those is capable of exploring and reinventing the game. And sometimes we reinvent the rules. And that's fine too. A great football player is not someone who decides to break the rules and go, well, if I grab the ball with my hands, it's way easier to get the ball in the goal. Well, that's not creativity. That's just chaos. Creativity and, 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 and ingenuity is to understand the rules of the game of football. For example, the offside rule, and I'm sorry if I'm losing some of my audience here, but the offside rule that dictates that there's an imaginary line and the defense line uh, creates that imaginary line and um, a striker cannot be past that line when a pass or the ball is passed um, to him or her. Okay, maybe that didn't make any sense. But the point is that the great player is the one who understands the offside rule. And instead of saying, I'll just stand by the goalie and, and score goals left and right because, you, you know, I've, I've found a loophole. There's no loophole there. You need to understand the offside rule. Stand and wait right on that line. And when that ball's back, when it, when it leaves the other player's foot, you cut that imaginary line. And we see great players do this flawlessly. A great player is not the one who picks up the ball with, with his hands and just runs. A great football player is the one who realizes that 
um, you know, with my feet, there's a lot more that I can do here. And that's creativity. That's the goal of play. That's the goal of um, role play. And especially in child development, this is so crucial. It's so fundamental to allow children to, to play, to draw, to explore, to, to make up voices and characters and come up with new games, new rules, new concepts. They become different people every day because they are trying to reinvent themselves, explore precisely who they are, who they want to become, how they want to operate in the world. That is why children do that, because when they run a simulation and that gives them no pleasure, guess what? They won't do it again. And that's, start, that's starting to tell you, as the parent or educator, exactly what kind of personality you're dealing with here. Is that child continually um, suggesting games that put the, 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 the child in the role of, of a caretaker or of a teacher? I mean... Let me just say this, making it personal. That was me. My kind of play when I was young, six, seven, eight years old, was to be a teacher. Guess what? I'm a teacher now, 30 years later, right? These things are not accidental. So allow your children to play. And if you're a teacher, create the games for them to explore. Because then you have control over the rules, but not the actual playing of the game. If you're a parent, participate in the play. Be willing to be in that role play. Be willing to be silly. Reconnect with your inner child. Don't roll your eyes when your kid wants to play with you. It's, it breaks my heart when I see parents disengaging and being merely or mere disciplinarians. Yes, that is important. Discipline is fundamental and I, I, I'm very fond of discipline. Children crave discipline for reasons that I've spoken about already before. It gives them boundaries. It gives them a sense of safety. This is where the boundaries of my freedom are, which as oppressing as it might feel, as long as they keep on expanding, then it's also safety. As long as they keep on expanding. If they keep on contracting, it's tyranny. If they keep on expanding as the child gains trust and develops, then we're talking about boundaries for safety. Engage in play. Engage in rules. Allow them to take the lead. Give them time to, to, be, to be the main character in the story that is developing in their heads. And with that, I will leave you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, comment, share, talk about it. Um, I appreciate the support and in the meantime, take care, stay well, bye-bye.